This is the Biz News Podcast, one-on-one conversations with experts in business and personal development. Artificial intelligence is the buzzword in business these days, but how do business leaders know if it's critical to their firm's success? Or maybe just the buzzing about what's hot? And how much time and money ought to be devoted to AI? Michael Greenberg is one who should know. He's been involved in artificial intelligence almost from its beginning, and now heads a company that helps businesses unlock growth through AI. He joins us for this episode of Biz News Interviews. Artificial intelligence, it is the buzzword in business, government, even in church, I suppose. But how does the business leader know when it's time to start investing in AI and how much time and money should they devote to it? Ooh. Well, I think uh, that's a great question, Doug. <laughs> um, first off, if you're a pastor... Do not use chat GPT to write your sermon. Let's just start right there. <laughs> if you're a business owner, uh, generally, depending on the type of business you're in, you know, how big your profit margin is, that sort of thing, anywhere from two to 5% of your budget uh, should go into what I call digital operations, which is not just the AI stuff but all of the digital connections and infrastructure and automation and data that you need to be able to do the AI stuff. That would include things like the customer portal and things like that. Exactly. Customer portals, CRM setup, making sure that your CRM talks to your invoicing software, talks to your customer support software, because the AI isn't going to be able to get all the information if it, all the information is not organized. Then, then, Michael, what good is AI, for heaven's sakes? Well, it's the cheapest intelligence that we have. So I sort of think of it as a, as a three-layer puzzle. Uh, we've got the most expensive brain power we can buy. It's going to be someone here in the U.S. Then you can go offshore you're getting a cheaper, but still very high quality brain power. The AI is even cheaper and it's on demand. And so it's not necessarily as smart. It's not necessarily as skilled, but for 10 cents, the AI can do something that might cost me $2 to do with somebody offshore that might cost me $20 to do with somebody in the US. Michael, how do I know that the AI is going to do it Right. You don't. Uh, that That's why people hire firms like mine, because we have a whole team of people where if we say, hey, we want the AI to be the email router or the first line of customer support, we're going to set up a system and then we're going to run a hundred, a thousand tests and make sure that we're getting 99% of the time it's accurate. And then the 1% it just errors out to a human instead of saying something wrong or lying. Wow, that sounds like a you you will be camped in the company in their back backyard for months. Uh it I'd say for like a complex workflow, say something like customer support where you want to understand the question, figure out who it's really supposed to go to, know how to answer properly. It might take us three or four months to document the entire process, interview the team, figure out what the AI actually can and can't do at this point, and then put the system into place, train the team on how to work with their new AI coworker, and uh, get them up to speed. If I'm a, a customer, do I want to deal with an AI bot of some sort when I call in? My general thought process is... No, I certainly hate dealing with any sort of automated support system when I call in somewhere, but that's a no with the exception of if somebody's spending, you know, 
five, 10, 20,000 a year with you, if they're a B2B customer of some sort, then you should absolutely have a human available for them. If they're spending 10 bucks a month with you, you know what? I understand if you don't have a human for me then. Okay, so pick up the phone, depending on how much they're they're uh, sending that check for every month. It's, you know, it's a classic software tactic. Premium is you're paying 10 times more for the ability to email them. And enterprise is you're paying 10 times more than that. So you can pick up a phone and call. Tell us a little bit about your company, which has an unusual name. Thanks. Uh, so my company is called Third Brain. Uh, Third Brain Digital Operations and Automation is the full name. And we are what we call a growth automation and digital operations partner for businesses. That means we work with you to develop your AI and technology strategy and to make sure you don't just pick the right tools, but you put them together the right way and you hire the right people to put the whole thing together. And so about a quarter of our clients just hire us as advisors to sort of guide them through that strategy, vet the talent, vet the team, that sort of thing. And then the rest hire us as a managed service provider where we take over all of this tech stuff for them. Uh, Michael, how do you get involved in this and when? Uh, well, I, I feel very good to feel young saying this for once. Um when you're getting interviewed by a lot of the, you know, 22 year old tech hosts today, they don't even remember floppy disks. Um, and I'm like, that's what I grew up on. I, I think uh, I have a few in a desk drawer around here someplace. I, I know I do. They're like, they still come in handy in a very rare occasion when you need to get windows 95 running. But, <laughs> um, I started my career just about 10 years ago, right when the tech industry was turning um, more mobile, more social. And I set out to start in B2B. So I started on the tech side of things, building MVPs for companies, helping them raise money and realized, oh, I hate coding. I'm going to switch over to the go-to-market side but I know enough about the tech that I can automate things in marketing and in operations. And we didn't have tools to do that yet. So I spent uh, most of my career sort of bridging the gap between that technology and business side of things and finding the tech solution to the different business problems. And then fast forward, I had sold my first company. I went to work for a much more experienced entrepreneur here in St. Louis. He told me, find your zone of genius. And I realized it was really setting up these sort of infrastructure systems for companies. ChatGPT came out six months later. Suddenly that infrastructure was the thing you needed in order to implement AI. And the rest is history. Now, you have been in since the, the first uh, switch was thrown, essentially. Tell <laughs> us... If you would, Michael, where do you see the whole AI thing going 5, 10, 15 years down the road? So I think in five years, we will really start to see the impact. The like the quality of intellig intelligence available in AI today is good enough to replace anything I have done in my 10 or 15 years of career outside of maybe like human to human sales or no, actually AI could definitely be a podcast host as well as me. Maybe not as well as you, not as well as me. All right. Sorry. Other way around better. You would be better than AI at it. I would be worse. Um, well, let's, let's hope we don't have to see that day coming. I mean, we're already seeing it. That's the problem. I, I, use, I have friends now who are using AI as their language tutor to learn Italian and Spanish. And I just started using it yesterday as a sales coach where I can have a conversation with chat GPT advanced voice mode 
and I can tell it, Hey, act like a sales coach. Here's my product. Here's the client profile I want you to mimic. And then let's do a mock sales call. And it can do that. How did it go? Did you get the sale? I, yeah, actually <laughs> I'm a tough customer. <laughs> <laughs> the chat GPT knew how to answer that question. Yeah. And, uh, so I think we're just going to see this sort of enter into all of our white collar, all of our knowledge work, but the human to human connections, you can't replace those with AI. And so those become more important. Whereas, oh, you know how to write code, you know how to edit a contract, probably going to become much less important, except in the rare super skilled cases. So, so folks that are trying to figure out coding right now so they can write the next hot game might uh, find themselves out of a job 10 years down the road. Well, they'll just have to design the games without writing the code. And let, let the uh, machine do the coding. Exactly. Now, that sounds like a, a pretty good use of the machine. I, you, I think it'll do that improvement. Okay, you you are a guru on this. What else do you see down the road? So that's a, that's like the next five years. Ten years out, I think we will probably have the production capacity and the internet connectivity to see like the human humanoid robot workers uh, be deployed pretty widely. I think most, at least most, like upper middle class households will probably have some sort of helper robot in their home. Um, because right now it's like 20 grand to buy one of those and stick it in your house. It's just not quite smart enough to do my laundry all the time the way I want it to, I'm guessing. But if I could pay 20 grand one time and have, you know, all of my cleaning and all of my dishes put away and just, basic help like that that'll pay for itself i'd take that deal so the the industry of the butlers is coming back a century after it left us fingers crossed and that'll <laughs> reduce our cost of labor at the same time in construction which will hopefully solve you know we've got a big problem in the trades right now uh not enough people there are a lot, when you think about uh, construction specifically I don't understand how a robot would be able to do anything that a skilled uh, construction worker can be doing today. They can't do any of the things inside of older houses. I can say that, but on like a brand new build, you know, everything's square. You've got everything's very specific components in wood a lot of it's made for larger machines to come in and work around it already. Um, so there are definitely ways, and I think we're going to see some robot assistance in some of this stuff. But to your point, at the end of the day, there's probably still too much variance inside of like each individual building for it to ever be a 100% robotic job. These sound like great things that we should anticipate. But is there a dark side to this? I mean, all of this comes with a dark side. Every one of these great, awesome use cases means that thousands of people will be out of work in the process. Uh, as we're recording this towards the end of 2024, we've got the uh, longshoremen on strike. And they are striking because robots can take their job. That's what the strike is literally about. Hey, we want to automate the ports and we don't want to renegotiate because we're going to automate them in the next few years. And the strike is, hey, we don't want you to automate. We want to get paid more because we don't feel we, we're getting the short end of the stick on this. You're going to automate us out of the job. And that's, you know, that's happening right now. It's not like a next year thing. Mike, Michael, what would you like to add that we haven't had a chance to uh, talk about your, your crystal ball is still on in case you want to do that. Ooh. Well, I think, uh, I think I would add one more thing. This, I know 
there's a there's a lot of doom and gloom that comes with this sort of change but really that only happens if you're unwilling to change with the times and i'm guessing you didn't start your career as a podcast host douglas <laughs> no it was uh w way back in the age of the buell trains i believe <laughs> and as a result you've had to change what you do over time as technology changed. That's what's happening right now. It's just going to happen a little faster and a little bigger than we're necessarily used to or comfortable with. And if we make those changes, everybody wants to be a game designer. Nobody wants to be a game developer. I've never met a game developer who got into game development because he wanted to write code all day. They did it because they wanted to make games that made people happy. And anything that gets you to that end result faster, in my mind, is ultimately a positive. One, one last thing, uh, as we have time. Where can our listeners and viewers get more information about you and your company? So you can find us at thirdbrain.co. That's the number three, R D B R A in.co and then we also have if you want to sort of learn all about digital operations we've got a little white paper at digitalopsplaybook.com you've been listening to the biz news podcast we welcome your input send your email to editor at biznews.com. That's B-I-Z-G-N-U-S dot com. Thanks for listening.